I'm Morris Konofsky. The world of Sholem Aleichem is everybody's world. It is filled with all the pleasures and disappointments of life. Its people are sad and funny, foolish and wise. Some good, some bad. Sholem Aleichem embraced them all. He wrote of their strength with pride, of their weakness with affection. He was a man who loved people. And in a moment, you will meet some that he loved best. I apologize. I don't mean to stare. Just looking. Trying to figure out what in all these treasures would interest you the most. My name is Mendel the bookseller. And I have here anything that a learned man could want in the way of a book. Here are novels, poetry, an edition of the commentaries, Good up to page 187, and the rest, but... So, while wisdom is no substitute for a piece of herring, a house with only fish is not a home. So browse, look them over, test the binding, some have pictures. Please, no obligation to buy. Oh, perhaps you would enjoy a four spice. Yeah. Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem is not only the name of a great Yiddish writer, but it is also an ancient greeting, meaning peace be with you. Oh, you knew that? When Sholem Aleichem had been in this country a short time, he met at the old wall of Astoria the great American writer, Mark Twain. And he introduced himself by saying, pardon my seeming in modesty, but they tell me, sir, that I'm the Yiddish Mark Twain. Mark Twain smiled and said, and they tell me, sir, that I'm the American Sholem Aleichem. You know something? Mark Twain was really Samuel Clemens, and Sholem Aleichem was Solomon Rabinowitz. Oh, you knew that too, huh? Oh, now the false price. Sholem Aleichem wrote here a story called The Enchanted Tailor. Where did he get the idea for the story? Like all great artists from the people. It's a folk story. It's a tale about Helm. What you ask is Helm? Helm is a famous city in the old country. And what's so special about Helm? Well, I'll tell you. Or better still, this passing angel will tell you. Because you see, in a way, she is responsible. Go ahead, go ahead, tell him. Tell him we're among friends. Well, I guess I did it. Me, the angel Rachelet, charged with distributing souls all over the earth. It's a big job, you'll admit. And one that even an angel could get tired of after several centuries and, and, and make a mistake. Well, I was flying as usual with my two bags of souls, one filled naturally with wise souls and one filled with foolish souls. So over Helm, there's that high mountain and that very high tree, which I did not see. And, well, the sun got in my eyes and, and the top of the tree ripped the bag filled with foolish souls and spilled them down in Helm. And that is how it came to be that Helm is, well, is filled with foolish souls. <laughs> <clears throat> That's history. Now, let's meet our characters. First, the Melamed, a Hebrew teacher. 
His good wife, Rifkla. Their great advisor, Rabbi David. And their goats. <laughs> but you want to see a goat? What's so special about a goat? A goat is a goat. Well, so one day, Rabbi David, the wisest man in all of Helm made this startling pronouncement. From now on, every poor man will eat cream, and every rich man will drink sour milk. What? No. no. Yes, I have discovered how to do it. So tell us, please, Rabbi. Let a decree be issued that from now on, sour milk is called cream, and cream is called sour milk. Rabbi, something has been bothering me. Could you tell me, please, why does a dog wag his tail? Because, my child, the dog is stronger than the tail. If it were the other way around, the tail would wag the dog. Then tell me this, Rabbi David. Why does the hair on a man's head turn gray before his beard? Well, what would you expect? The hair on a man's head is 20 years older than his beard. Oh. Rabbi, something else has been bothering me. I have plenty of time. Why is the ocean so salty? You don't know that. Naturally, because of the thousands of herrings who live there. <laughs> that is the wisest man in all of hell. Now, the Malala. Rifkila, my queen. Yes, my Malamed. Rifkila, my queen. I've been thinking. Good, my Malamed. If I were the Tsar, I'd be richer than the Tsar. How, my Malamed? I would do a little teaching on the side. That is only one side of his nature. For the other, I must tell you that once the Malamed left Helm and he forgot to take his slippers. So he sat down and he wrote a letter to his wife. Dearest Rifkala, be sure and send me your slippers. I have put down your slippers because if I wrote my slippers you would read my slippers and send me your slippers. So therefore I say plainly your slippers so you will know and send me my slippers. Now Rivkala herself is a somebody. A person with definite ideas and opinions. A person with a superior mentality even for help. So Rivkala. How much do I owe you for your uncle's letter? Let's see. Um, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, five and two is seven. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four and three is seven. And seven, two, four, let's see. Ah, two times seven is 11. Excuse me, Rivkala. Two times seven is 14. No, you're wrong. Two I'm times seven is 11. I'm wrong? Of course. When I married the Malamed, I was a widow with four children. He, too, at the time was a widow, and he had four children. Since we are married together, we have three children. So he has seven children, and I have seven children. Together, we have 11. <laughs> Now, we are almost ready for the story of the goat. I said almost, because there's one last thing that you must understand. The relationship between the Melamed and his wife. Now listen carefully, because this is not a simple matter. Ah, my Melamed, you're back from the market. Of course I'm back. I went, I'm back. So where's the chicken I sent you to buy? Well, when I went to see the woman who sells the chicken, she said her chicken was so fat. Oh, I said, 
fat is better than chicken. So when I went to see the man who sells the fat, he said his fat was so wonderful, it was like oil. Oh, I said, oil is better than fat. So when I got there, they said their oil was so pure, it was like water. Aha, I said, water is better than oil. So, instead of a chicken, I brought you a pitcher of water. So I'll get your glass. Why? Your dinner is ready. Now we are ready for the story. Then this time I mean it. Unless, of course, you insist on a few words about a goat. But what can you say about a goat? A goat is a goat. And this goat was not even from Chelm, but from the next village, which was famous for its goats. And that's the point of the whole story. So one morning, tonight? Why not? Why should we scrape and scrimp from morning till night and deprive ourselves all our lives? Here, take the money we saved. Go to the next village, get a goat, and tonight we'll have blintzes for supper. I'll go this minute. Not so fast. You remember with the chicken? Of course I remember. So this time, a goat. Naturally, a goat. And please, a female goat that gives milk. Does milk come from a billy goat? Does a pitcher of water lay eggs? stopped off at an inn which was run by his friend Dodie. Now Dodie served a very nice glass of wine, not very expensive, and a very pleasant fellow to talk to. But also he was given to practical jokes. So in a little while we'll have the goat. Fine, fine, fine. Hold still, hold still, still, still. What is it? Hold still, 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 still. Zip. What was it? Nothing. I thought it was a fly. It has all the same the candy metal for one boy. I'm pretty a good friend. 
Perfectly shabby looking animal. It's a wonder it's standing on its legs at all. And the eyes. <laughs> you should see so good. This morning a man was here. He offered an exchange for I'll go to cow. I turned him down. She should only live till I get her home. Sixties lotus. As a matter of fact, she's not for sale. One hundred. One hundred? Well, in that case, I'm going. Goodbye. Sixty-five. I shouldn't stand here talking to you. My children are sick. Ninety. Ninety. I think I hear one of them crying. You better go in. Seventy! All right. All right, we'll call the whole thing off. Eighty. Eighty? Well, I'm going. My wife will wonder what happened to me. Seventy-five. Shalom Aleichem, seventy-seven. Aleichem Shalom, seventy-six. Sold. I see you're a man who appreciates value. All right, all right. But there's no doubt that this is a... A she-goat? Well, you said a goat for milking. You think I'd sell you a... a billy goat? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> She'll give, at the very least, a pail of milk a day. Goodbye, Malkala. <laughs> Malkala? <laughs> To make a long story short, when she told me the goat gives a pail of milk a day, I offered her 40 zlotas, and she sold it to me. Fine, fine, very fine. If we switch a male goat for his female goat, it could be very funny. <laughs> oh, boy, I pray I go far. So you're going to celebrate your new goat, huh? So tomorrow night you'll come. Uh -huh. We'll eat blintzes together. Did you ever stop and think what you can make from goat's milk? For instance, the omelette. An omelette is an omelette, but from goat's milk, it's a... A symphony, a symphony. Or else we'll make... You'll come? Of course I'll come. Invite me. You're invited. Boy, how do you have a kind of milk? Boy, I pray go for... What's the matter, Rivkala? A pail of milk a day at least, she said. Maybe a pail a day, but not milk. It's a billy goat. A genuine female, she said. Enough. Take it back already. Bring back what I sent you for, a female goat that brings milk. What's the matter? I'll tell you, but you wouldn't tell another soul? No, no. This woman who sold me the goat. Yeah. It was a billy goat. Oh, no. 
Give me back my money. Just a minute. What's the difficulty? Listen, lady, do I look like a child? Does it strike you I was born only yesterday? Please, Malamet, I'm a busy woman. So if you're a busy woman, give me back my money and take back your billy goat. What? Where are your eyes? Never mind. I trusted you. I paid you the price you asked, and you do this to me. I won't say another word. Watch. Impossible. Milk from a billy goat. This is milk. This is the goat that gave the milk. You're a malamed. It's a lady goat. Only an hour ago it was a billy goat. So what have you been drinking? Who gets to drink that doty? All right, so take your goat and goodbye. Goodbye, Makala. Look, lady, listen, <laughs> I'm convinced. I really am. This is a lady goat. Only do me a favor. You have a rabbi here. What a question. You have a rabbi in hell? Are we godless people? Are we? Well, uh, there's no need to get excited. I only ask a simple question. Is there a rabbi? So? So, please ask him to do me a favor, to give me a certificate that says that this is a lady goat that gives milk. It's crazy. I just milked her. You saw me milk her. Here's the milk. I know it. You know it. <laughs> the goat knows it. But for Ifkala, my wife, take me to your rabbi. On the way back, he stopped off at Dodie's. And Dodie, once again. So, when the Malamed got back to his house... I'm speechless. Absolutely speechless. For the first time in my life, I don't have a word to say. What did I do, Rifkala? Nothing, not a thing. Only do me a favor. The next time I send you for something, don't go. You said a goat that gives milk. This is the goat. I saw the woman. Please, I... not another word. It's a billy goat. Impossible. <laughs> Listen to that poor goat. Not only is it impossible, but I have a certificate here that says that this is a lady goat that gives milk, signed by three expert witnesses, including the rabbi. Would the rabbi tell a lie? Would the goat herd lie, too? Would all three sign a paper bearing false witness, would they? Please, somebody come and take him away. Why excite yourself? This is beyond us. You say this goat is a billy goat. The certificate says that this is a lady goat that gives milk. We'll take the problem to Rabbi David, who, after all, is the wisest man in all hell. He'll settle it. Go get it. <laughs> I see. <laughs> One, two, three witnesses, including a rabbi? Fine-looking document, huh, Rapper? What's the difference of document? Look at the goat. Is that a female goat? The animal is without question a he-goat. There are certain unmistakable signs. Of course, I told you. But the document, Rabbi. But still, the document is not to be denied. Don't forget, three witnesses, including a rabbi. So this is my decision. Yes. yes. The law is on the side of the Malamed. The animal is a she-goat, and this is proved beyond all question by the document. But it is equally clear, and it must be so ordained, that whenever a she-goat is brought into Helm by some process beyond my understanding, she becomes a he-goat. Uh, Rabbi David. If you weren't too busy, would you stay for dinner? If I were not too busy for Rifkala's cooking, <laughs> I would be pleased to stay. Well, Rabbi, if you could stay and you weren't too busy, what would you like? Blintzes. Uh, Rifkala, my queen, where are you going? Malamadal, my king. Take the goat to the next town. And when the he-goat becomes a she-goat, we'll all have... Blinces. <laughs> well, that settled it. And all the townsfolk 
marveled that a new Solomon was in Helm. So, the Malamed, his wife, Rabbi David, the goat, and all the Helamites settled down to a normal life. And they would be at it still to this very day, except that all the Helamites are no longer in hell. You see, they were scattered during a very heavy rain that almost destroyed their city. And they went to all parts of the earth. Maybe you met one in your lifetime. Who knows? Maybe there's one sitting next to you right now. What would the world of Sholem Aleichem be without Isaac Lowe Peretz? Isaac in Hebrew means laughter. Isaac Lowe Peretz. A man who was a poet, a playwright, a journalist. He ran a flour mill, was the manager of a brewery, a Hebrew teacher, and also he was a lawyer. This story, and others like this, he used to read in the language of the working people in Yiddish, to the working people. And because in those days this was not very popular with the Tsar, Isaac Lowe Peretz spent a little time in jail. Well, it's a fact, what can I do? And later, nearly 50 years later, in another terrible time for the Jews, in the Hitler time, in Warsaw, in the ghetto itself, this story was read at the risk of your life. Still, the people read it. It's not a long story. It's not a big story. In Yiddish, it runs about 12 pages. In English, about nine and a half. A story in Yiddish is always 25% better. Well, 25% longer anyway. It's not a weighty story. Not a poem, as we say. What a story, a mice. It is called Buncher Schwein, which means Buncher the Silent. And it begins in heaven with the sound of the ram's horn.
heard the shofar like that before, never. You can hear it all the way up to the seventh heaven. Maybe he's creating a new world, a second creation. Do you think it could be Judgment Day? Listen to that. What's happening here? You haven't heard? Buncher Schweig is dead. Who? Buncher Schweig. has left the earth. Buncher Schweig? Buncher Schweig. Really? Listen, listen. He's at the heavenly gate. Who? I've got to get Father Abraham. Who? What's that? Wait, it's his armchair, the golden armchair for Buncher Schweig. Who? Oh, how beautiful. This will be his crown. Look at those pearls and the diamonds in the center. I have to take it to the Holy Presence. He wants to inspect it himself. Don't. Don't. The Heavenly Court hasn't met yet. Has the Heavenly Court met yet? What difference does it make? It's just a formality. Even from Moses, they held Heavenly Court. Listen, if this case lasts longer than five minutes, well, you don't understand. This is von Schweig. Who? He's here. He's come, that von Schweig. Here he comes, von Schweig. There he is. Come, Bunchman. Yes, you, Bunch of Come. Don't you know me? I'm Abraham, Father Abraham. Pinch yourself, you'll see it's not a dream. Come into the heavenly presence. Come. Come. Heavenly Court is in session waiting for you. Won't you sit here? Sit, won't you? Case of Bunche Schweig. Start, but be brief. The defending angel. Ready. The prosecuting angel. Always ready. Proceed, but quickly. His name is Bunche Schweig. Bunche, the silent. And his name fitted him like a cloak made in the hands of a master tailor. No similes, please. His death, like his life on earth, made no impression. If a horse had dropped dead in the street, it would have attracted more attention. But then if there were as many horses as there are men like him, the horse, too, would have gone unnoticed. Metaphor. No metaphors. He never complained of either God or man. Hatred never flashed into his eyes. He never raised his voice in bitterness to heaven. Rhetoric! And no rhetoric, please. Job was unlucky. This man was even less fortunate. At his bris, no wine was drunk. 
At his bar mitzvah, no speeches were made. He lived like a grain of sand, along with millions like him. And when the wind picked him up and blew him upside down, no one noticed. My dear angel for the defense, this is a soul on trial. The facts, only the facts are what we want. His mother died when he was 13, and he inherited a stepmother who was a snake. Insinuations against a third party? Come, come. I beg your pardon. He didn't complain. Instead of food, he got moldy bread. Instead of meat, he got the gristle and skin. Winter times, he chopped the wood barefoot in the yard, his hands and feet frozen. The black and blue marks show through the holes in his pants. Did he complain? Yes, yes, proceed. He didn't even complain to his father. <coughs> this is what this is. His father, that drunk. You'll be heard from all in due time. Proceed. He had nobody to play with ever. He never spent a day in the cheder. He never had a book. He never had a coat that wasn't somebody else's first. He never had a minute to himself. His father, drunk one night, threw him out of the house into the street. He picked himself up and went, whichever way the wind was blowing. However hungry he got, he kept silent. He begged only with his eyes. How many times he was arrested? Vagrancy, loitering, no visible means of support, I couldn't begin to tell you. How many times he found work the dirtiest, the heaviest, the most meal, and didn't get paid, I couldn't list them all. And worse than working, harder was the finding of the work. And through it all, silence. Could I suggest, please, time is... Oh. Free. No. You go on. When they splashed mud on him, when they spit on him, when they made him walk in the gutter and told him, keep off the sidewalk, when he stood in a doorway begging for money, he was owed on a job, and they told him, come back later. Now it's not convenient. When they paid him as they did, only in part, or cheated him, or gave him counterfeit money, he kept silent, although starvation and death were constantly at his side. Once, good fortune smiled. Oh. He stopped two runaway horses and saved the life of the man inside, the owner of the carriage although the driver of the carriage was killed. He was made the coachman, and he inherited a wife. And more than that, a child. The wife and child of the driver killed in the accident. When his newfound benefactor went bankrupt and didn't pay him what he was owed, he was silent. When his new wife ran away and left him with a newborn baby, he was silent. And 15 years later, when the boy grew up and threw him out of the house, even then, silence! When the same benefactor ran him down on the street and the carriage wheels rolled over him, he didn't tell the police who had done it. And in the hospital, his back broken, nothing. And in a hospital, you can say anything. Scream, even, it's permitted. Yes. And when the doctor wouldn't touch his case without payment in advance, and the same for the hospital attendant who wouldn't give him a glass of water without first being paid, even then, silence. Silence in his last minute on earth in the death struggle. Silence in death. Have you finished? <clears throat> One moment more. He was buried in a pauper's grave. Even the grave digger doesn't remember him. A little stick was put up to mark the grave. The next day, the wind blew it over, and the grave digger's wife found it and used it to stir a pot of potatoes. And in all, from birth to death, not a word against God, not a word against man. The defending angel is concluded. Then, the prosecuting angel. Angels in heaven. Angels in heaven.
As he was silent, angels in heaven, so I will be silent. Bonche, my child. Bonche, Suffered and you kept silent all your life. You never knew your power, the strength of someone who has never felt a moment's hate in his life. You never understood that you could have raised your voice and your cry would have shaken the walls of Jericho. The very walls of heaven would have fallen before your cry. We will not judge you, nor pass sentence, nor try to find a reward that is right and just and proper for you. Take what you want. Everything is yours, anything. Ask anything you like, it's yours. We mean it. Really, everything is yours. Everything there is in heaven belongs to you. Because everything here is only the reflection of your own self. You see, Poncha, you're only taking what's yours. Anything. If it's true, could I perhaps have every day, please, a hot roll of fresh butter?
here the last will and testament of Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem was born in Russia in 1859, and he died in New York City in 1916. I'll read part of it. No matter where I may die, I do not want to be buried among aristocrats, the nobles, or wealthy, but among the common people, workmen, the people proper. There are to be no titles or eulogies except my name, Sholem Aleichem, on one side and the Jewish inscription on the other. There are to be no discussions or debates among my colleagues about the perpetuation of my name or the erection of a monument in New York or the like. I should not be able to find rest in my grave if my friends were to play fools. On the anniversary of my death, my only surviving son and my son-in-law, if they so desire, may say Kaddish. That's the prayer for the dead. But should they have no such desire, or should the time not permit, or should it be against their religious convictions, they may accomplish the same object by assembling with my daughters, my grandchildren and friends, in selecting one of my stories and read it in whatever language may be best intelligible to them. So, here is another story by Sholem Aleichem, one of his most beloved, gymnasium, the high school, in remembrance. Wonderful. Wonderful? I didn't crack my knuckles. I crack my knuckles so. Live cautiously and quietly, I always say. Cautiously and quietly. Cautiously and quietly, I run my business. Cautiously and quietly, I make a living. Cautiously and quietly, I went bankrupt twice already. And cautiously and quietly, I began with God's help from the beginning all over again. Yeah. I've got my seat in the synagogue, a business that doesn't do so bad. I'm blessed with a son and a wife. I'm blessed also with a wife, you, Hanele. A man. A man. <laughs> a man, Hanele, after all, is something. God created first Adam, first the man. That God created Adam first is his business, but that he put more sense in my little finger than in your whole head is not my fault. In uh, what connection are you bringing this up? When a decision has to be made, so who makes it? Now, uh, what's the decision you're rubbing the same spot on the samovar already a half an hour for? So when was the last time you were in your son's room with your eyes open? What kind of a question? So answer the question. So ask it without insulting me. I was there this morning. What did you see? <laughs> I saw what was in front of my eyes. What did you see? What do you mean, what did I see? I saw, I saw what was there. So I repeat, when was the last time you were in Mercer's room with your eyes open? You didn't see books? <laughs> the books. Of course I saw the books. What books? The, the books, the Bible, the Gomorrah, the Hebrew books. In the boys' room of books, the Gomorrah, the Hebrew book, yes. A geography book you didn't see? A book of maps you didn't see? A tourist book on South America you didn't see? What? A, a big picture. You didn't notice it? What picture? Over his bed. He put it up himself. A big train with smoke crossing over the whole big country. Over his bed? Wait, 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 Aaron. You'll see it later. Aaron, don't you see? He's opening his eyes. He's reading. He's thinking. New grass grows. Old grass dies. He, uh. he, he wants to learn. He wants to know more than they teach in the Cheda. What will he do? What does he want out of life? What will he be when he grows up? New grass grows. Old, Old grass, grass dies. dies. Grass. With God's help, he'll grow up in good health and he'll go into the business with me. Sure. For you, the only reason the sun rises in the morning is it's time to open the shop. And the only reason the sun goes down at night is it's time to close up. Please, Hannah, talk simple. What's on your mind? How is Moshe going to get into the high school? What? 
Where is it written that Moshe has to get into the high school? If you would take your nose out of the account books for five minutes, you'd know that's what the boy wants. He wants to learn more than they teach in the Cheder. Is that so? The Cheder isn't enough. The Bible, the Gomorrah, the Talmud, not enough. He has to get into the high school, their high school. Their high school? The high school. There are some things you can't learn in the Cheder. <laughs> Education is supposed to be for everybody. The high school is supposed to be for everybody, not only Gentiles. One page of everybody the Gomorrah. Everybody says that a good education, mathematics, Then everybody's grammar. crazy. Mm, certainly, and you're the only one in their right mind. I, if my enemies and my friends' enemies had in their pocket what you have in your head. Uh, please, no insults. I wouldn't envy them. I don't envy a man who has to take advice from a woman. And I don't envy a woman that has a man that needs advice from a woman. Go, go crack your knuckles. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding, the answer is no study for the high school. Anna, I feel like a... The boy is studying. I feel like a glass of tea. In the kitchen. You, you don't know where the tea is. And don't rattle the spoon in the glass. I'll even bite the sugar with my mouth closed. What are you worried about? The junior high school preparatory examinations are not so simple. Yeah, junior preparatory entrance examination. What are you worrying your head about? You could travel up and down the land, far and wide, east and west, and you won't find a finer head anywhere. After all, he's the son of a father. <laughs> Junior preparatory entrance examination. One page of the Gomorrah Papa? is what... Yes, Moshe. I have to do a review. You read me the questions, and I'll give you the answers. Certainly, I'll read you the questions, you'll give me the answers. Moshe, you're glad we decided you should go into the high school. All right, all right, we'll see. So, what's this? What kind of language is this? What are they stuffing the boy's head with? It's algebra, Papa. Algebra? This is algebra. So what's algebra? Give me the book. Algebra is arithmetic. So if it's arithmetic, I can't read it. What do I do in the shop all day? Addition, subtraction, algebra. So I'll ask the questions. All right, Papa. Problem number one, top of the page. All right. <laughs> X plus Y equals 11. X minus Y equals 3. How much is X? What X? What's X? What's Y? How do you know? Uh, the answer's in the back, Papa. Page 233. 33. So if the answer's in the back, I can't find it. Please. X equals 7, Y equals 4. Huh? What? The answer's in the back, Papa. Page 233. X equals 7, Y equals 4. X. Correct. X equals 7, Y equals 4. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it's simple. And you're worried because they give it a fancy name. Junior preparatory entrance examination. A boy who can do X and Y in his head. Moshe, tell me, what is an X? What is this Y? This is the list, please. Just a moment, madam. The junior preparatory? Shh, shh, shh. It is indeed, madam, the junior preparatory entrance examination. Congratulations. His son made it. No, and ours will be any different. What are you worried about? A boy who knows X and Y like you and I know ABC. I got an F. F? What F? There are three grades in my husband's mind. P for passing, E for excellent, F for failure. Got an F, he failed. Impossible. A boy with a head like his, known throughout the whole town, the whole county, Cats, Moshe, F. All right, it's that 
Well, I always said it. If his learning isn't, what's settled? What's settled? He'll take the senior examinations. We were the tutor, there'll be no trouble. Now, what are you talking about? He failed the junior. So next year, when he takes examinations, he'll be a year older. And the right age for the, the, the senior examination. So naturally, he'll need a tutor. Naturally? Can I tutor him? Can you? You don't know two words of grammar, let alone geometry. What are you talking about, geometry? The subjects you'll have to study to for, for next year's examinations. Settled. No, 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 no. This time I put my foot down. There will not be any tutors, no more examinations, no algebra, no grammar, no geometry, and this... Look me in the face, Hannah. I'm looking. This is final. What is the area of a circle, Moshka? Pi R squared. And the circumference of a circle? 2 pi r. Pythagoras theorem. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the adjacent sides. Expressed algebraically, Moshka. A square plus b square equals c square. Good evening, Professor Tutor. Now for the declensions, Moshka. First nominative. Since when did it become Moshka? Moshe isn't good enough. We have a semblance of silence. A semblance. First nominative, then genitive, dative, and accusative. The word... Salami. Such a word for grammar. He has to insult us to our faces. A order, please. Now decline... Garlic. Not only do I pay him an arm and a leg, garlic, salami. God forgive me for what I'm thinking. If you continue, I'll have to ask you to leave. Another minute, I'll take him by the leg and I'll throw him out the window. I know how you feel. But he's learning, he'll pass, he'll enter the high school. That's the important thing. Yeah, uh, his kind I know already. Only tell me, suppose Moshe fails again. Fail, fail. He won't fail. A boy with a head like his, why should you give such a thing a thought? Why should he fail? Algebra, grammar, nominative, additive, subtractative, he'll pass. <laughs> What are you doing? Looking for all your friends, too? <laughs> You've been there for 20 minutes. Well. Four P's passed in everything. <laughs> you can congratulate me, too. <laughs> your son passed, did he? He uh -oh. is boasting. We didn't look at it yet. Excuse me, please. Four E's. E? Better than P for passing. E for excellent. Four E's. <laughs> Four E's. Uh, what did I tell Four you? E's. There'll be schoolmates, my son Moshe and yours. Is that so? Perhaps they will be. <laughs> what does he mean by that? <laughs> Four E's. What are you standing there boasting, congratulating yourself for? Mm, so what now? Only perhaps. Four E's? This is a perhaps? You never heard of the quota system? Ten Gentiles, one Jew. Twenty Gentiles, one Jew. A ah, boy with a head like that. Four E's, they'll be honored. Honored, maybe, but not accepted. Four E's, that Mercer did. Now it's your turn. Turn? What turn? You never heard of friends? Influence? Pull strings? Insurance? You never heard of that? No. Such a thing is beneath my dignity. Study, yes. Tutors, yes. But what you are suggesting... Please. Just do it. I absolutely refuse. I absolutely... Please. All right. My 
name is Katz, Your Honor. Aaron Katz. Yes. I, I, I would like to speak to you about my son, Moshe. Uh, Moshka, that is. What is it you want? Mr. Principal, or maybe you're Mr. Director. <laughs> My son, Moshe, or Moshka, as you say, is a bright boy, a, 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 a fine boy, if a father could speak without prejudice, a, a fine chap. I'll begin from the beginning. We are not wealthy, Your Honor. On the other hand, we have some small means, and we have a son, Moshka, as I mentioned, an only child. And he would like to study in your fine high school. And, and, and my wife, who is a modern woman, she wants the boy to study very much. What is it you want? I'll speak plain, Your Honor. <laughs> the boy wishes to study. I wish him to study. And my wife, who understands all about such things, she says to me, she says, Aaron, <laughs> that's my name, Your Honor, she says, Aaron, I want the boy to study very, very much. I'm a very busy man. Now, just what do you want? Oh, no, no, don't, don't be offended, Your Honor. It's a, it's a simple idea. <laughs> you see, rich, we're not, Mr. Principal director, but poor we're not either, so the boy wishes to study. I wish him to study. And my wife wants very, very much that. Sit down. Certain information is necessary. Sit down. <laughs> Your name, the boy's name, his age, the grade he's to enter. I take it he qualifies. I beg pardon, Your Honor. The entrance examinations. Oh, oh, oh yes, certainly. Perfect marks. E for excellent. In algebra E, in grammar E, in... Name? In uh, 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 Katz. Katz is my name. The boy is Moshka. M-O-S-H-K-A. -S Moshka. His health is perfect. <laughs> he, he, he'll be 15 next November. His teeth... He took the senior preparatory. He enters fifth grade. The fifth? Oh, thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Anything else, Your Honor, any information, his height, the color of his eyes, the size of his shoes. You will enter the class at the commencement of the next term, September. The class is closed for this term. Good day. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, it has to be so long, Your Honor. September 15th, the boy will report to me. It, it, it has to be next term, Your Honor. It couldn't be this term. Until September 15th. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, we like our boys dressed in the school uniform. <laughs> of course, Your Honor. This card will serve as an introduction to the store that sells our uniform. You'll tell the merchant I sent you. Be sure to mention my name. Yes, of course. We like our boys dressed just so. We like that very, very much. Oh, yes, Your Honor, very, very much. And I should mention your name. Good day. What are you doing? 
doing? Shh, I'm busy. My uncle Schleimer, your uncle Maxwell, my tante Rosalie, your tante Reba. Cookies, cakes, kremsla, sweet wine, schnapps. Who's getting married? Nine, ten, including tante Fanny's latest. He should only marry her. No. A bar mitzvah? Who's bar mitzvah? Today's the 14th. Tomorrow September 15th, no? So? So, so he says. So tomorrow Moshe enters the senior class. I'll say it again. So, Kremslach, sweet wine, schnapps. You think he was elected shamus in a synagogue? You call yourself a father. And you begrudge your son a, a little celebration. Inhuman, that's what you are. Oh, of course, now I'm inhuman. I've got no feelings in the matter. I didn't stay up half the night coaching him for his examination. I didn't hear him recite the uh, square of the hypotenuse, A square plus B square, C square. Why are you crying? So where's your heart? A Jewish boy is finally entering the school. Our son. And for a few pennies, you make a fuss. A few pennies? This is a penny? Show me where sweet wine is a penny, schnapps is a penny. Not another word. Not one single word, not another word will I speak to you. For me, you don't exist. Ramslach, could I have one? Sure, of course. Me, keep your hands off. Him, certainly, of course. Here, Papa, I don't want to hold one. No. You tell your Papa to get the little glasses from the china closet. And go, wash your hands and brush your hair. And they'll be here any minute. And put on your new uniform. Not an ounce of human feelings. <laughs> enough is enough already. I didn't bankrupt myself nearly for the boy's education. I didn't smear the principal, did I? The uniform he's putting on, the coat, the cap, the silver buttons. I didn't pay double in the special store. Tell your Papa I'm still waiting for the little glasses. Mama? The turn. <laughs> what a fear. Turn around. You know, who pulled your coat down like that? <laughs> yeah? A senior in the high school we raised, Hannah. It's worth everything, no, Aaron. Huh? <laughs> Tell your father to get the little glasses. Hannah, please be a little bit reasonable. Talk to me at least. What did I say? Did I say no? The only thing was I didn't say yes loud enough. Uh, Hannah, uh, holler at me. And your father least. not only has an uncle's in here, but everybody in the next village. Oh, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, oh, wait you see, well, you have to see anything. Oh, 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 my oh, 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 such a nice cap, such a uniform. Such a fine boy, my <laughs> son. Oh, my son. Oh, congratulations. No, no, this calls for a drink. A, a glass of sweet wine. <laughs> a glass of sweet wine, a glass of schnapps. Um, uh, Moshe, tell your mama to tell me where the glasses are. I'll get them. Tell your papa if you listen to me the first time. I wouldn't have to say it three times. No, so tell her to tell me where already. In the china closet with the glass door. Oh. Uh. By the wall near the curtains on the second shelf on the right hand side. <laughs> and ask your papa already how many years is he living here? No, uh, how many are they taking in this time? Two. Slepsons uh, uh, of Rom in Moshe. Two? Out of how many altogether, including Gentiles? Twenty-five. Twenty-three Gentiles, two Jews. Last year they took only one. They're getting liberal. They're <laughs> 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 getting liberal every day. <laughs> 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 Uncle, Uncle Maxwell? What? Uncle Maxwell? What? Uncle? When will it be they won't have any quotas? When? When the ace of spades is yellow 
And the color of wine is blue. Matthias. Matthias. In good health, he should study. In good health, he should graduate. In good health, he should go and enter the university. Wait, wait, wait. That's going a little too far. Let him finish high school. With God's help, we'll get him married and uh, into the business. Tell him his ideas are old-fashioned. Tell her maybe the ideas are old-fashioned. But when people with new-fashioned ideas get smart, they come back to the old-fashioned ideas. Tell her. And tell him that if <laughs> the boy would only... I shall uh, tell you, Papa and ma Mother, if this keeps up, there won't be a party. <laughs> so let's eat and drink, and with God's help, make such a noise, the entire world will know a fine Jewish boy is entering the high school. They take me. Well, today my boy begins to be a man. Oh, don't misunderstand. A bar mitzvah makes a boy a man. But life makes a bar mitzvah man a real man. I understand, Papa. Don't forget, I'm 15. <laughs> 15. Two years you're working now to get into the high school. Well, it's over, it's done with. Whatever it costs, it's worth it. <laughs> For a while, I thought maybe the Almighty, who of course moves in his own ways. Well, the main thing is they took you. All right, Papa, I'll take the books. <laughs> I'll see you after school. Wait, wait, wait. I, I want to come along. I want to see how the door opens. I want to see the door shut. I'll listen a while, maybe outside the window. <laughs> the square of the hypotenuse, maybe the subje subjective. Oh, here's the principal. <laughs> Good morning, sir, director. Well, here's the boy. How do you do, sir? What are you here for? <laughs> the principal's joking. <laughs> it's uh, the, the, the 15th of September, sir, the start of the new term. What's the name? Moshe Katz. Uh, uh, he means Moshka Katz. <laughs> M-O-S-H-K-A. Moshka. You remember what we... What grade? The fifth. You said it yourself, Your Honor. The class was full last term. You suggested a little wait and... There is no Moshka Katz in the fifth grade. Oh, look again, Your Honor. One of your teachers told my wife. Twenty-five boys were admitted. Twenty-three, like you, sir, and... Shepselson and Katz, two Jewish boys. Oh, yes, there is a Katz. Morduk Katz in the fifth grade. Oh, no, no, not Morduk, Your Honor. Moshka. M-O-S-H-K-A. Moshka. Morduk Katz. No, no it, it, it sounds the same, Your Honor, but Moshka. Well, it's quite clearly written. I wrote it. Morduk. Two years in your office, in your handwriting. I mentioned your name. Morduk Katz. Mordek, Mordek is the son of Chaim, the tailor. I am Aaron, who runs a grocery. And my son is Moshka. Moshka! Moshka! Moshka!
How do you feel, Marcia? I don't know, Mama. Maybe Papa was right all along. Papa was right? How, much? Well, why should we go where we're not wanted? So where are we wanted? Should we disappear off the face of the earth, too? Is that your idea? I don't know. So let me ask you a question. You want to go to school, this I know. Why, Mercy? To study, to, to find out about things. To be something, maybe. A little more than me than Papa, huh? Papa's all right, Mama. He stayed and argued with the man. I ran away. When that man started to go through that list, I just wanted to run and, and, and hide. Don't be ashamed. You're not the first one. It hurts, much. But you can't run away. Where would you run? I know. And you want to go to school even more now, no? So get the bag. In the closet on the top, you'll find it. We'll pack. school with degrees from a university. Couldn't even spell her name straight. Marcia told me you tried to talk to him. Talk? What can you say to a stick? Where is he? Inside. We did a terrible thing, Hannah. What terrible? A, 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 a bride left waiting without a bridegroom. With his new uniform, the shiny buttons, a cap with a silver badge. I, I told you, but you wouldn't listen. It would have been better if we didn't try. Why do you think I said it? The hater is enough. What he learns in our schools is enough. I didn't want him to be hurt. I... Hello, Moshe. Hello, Papa. Uh, on the table, Moshe. And get your warm underwear, and put in, your, put in your uniform, and get the heavy socks. What are you doing? Oh, I see. <laughs> That's a good idea, Hannah. A little trip to Tante Sarah's a few days so the boy shouldn't get sick. Huh? Bite your tongue, let my enemies get sick. Mm, so what then? This is not the only high school in the country. What? There are other high schools. You'll go traveling to find a high school? More tutors, more schmearing, uniforms, quotas, principals. He'll enter a high school. He'll enter like he entered today. No. Aaron, he'll go to a high school, if not here, than someplace else. I'm not giving up now just because you, you think there's no other answer. Why, Hannah? Tell me why. A minute ago you said it yourself. With the cap on, with the badge, with the shiny buttons. What did it feel like before the principal opened his mouth? Of course, certainly. But where would you go? You could stumble around in the desert for 40 years. The 40 years came to an end once before, no? Fine. Moshe, we'll take Papa's warm gloves. They'll fit you. Take Papa's warm gloves, they'll fit you. Moshe. Moshe, what do you think, huh? Chasing after a high school. I want to go, Papa. Today won't be the last slap in the face you'll get. I know. No. I couldn't fight one, so how could I fight two? You know something? Now I'm getting stubborn. Dear husband, tomorrow he takes the examination at the conservatory high school. I can't wait for results. Dear wife, Never mind the examinations. With a head like his, he'll pass. What about the quota? Dear husband, they took 85 boys, no Jews. Dear Moshe, tomorrow's your birthday, 16. So maybe the Lord will bless us with a school where they'll honor the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Dear Papa, if Spinoza took the exams and Rothschild talked to the principal, the answer would still be the same. 
Dear Hannah, business is bad, the house is empty. Why beat your head against a stone wall? Husband, the Almighty has taken pity on us. We found a school that takes one Jew for every Gentile. A quota of 50%. Moshe is taking examinations today. Wife, I don't wish to discuss the subject. I wouldn't allow my hopes to go up even this high. Aaron, he passed. But what's more, the principal today said he's accepted. He's entering next week. Hannah, I'm not breathing till I hear from you. Come immediately. Complication. <laughs> I'm here. I kissed you already. My health is terrible. I can't sleep at night. The store might as well be closed. What's the complication? Sit down, Aaron. All right, I'm sitting. The quota is 50%. One Jew for every Gentile. But every Jew that wants his son admitted has to bring along a Gentile. And if the Gentile passes as well as a Jew, of course, and if the fee is paid and the receipt is gotten for both, then your boy can be admitted. So every Jew must have his own Gentile. <laughs> That's nice. Two headaches instead of one. Not even two Jewish headaches. That's what they mean by a 50% quota. <laughs> 50%. It's a new kind of algebra, 50%. Like the man in the army, he says to the captain, Captain, what are we eating? The captain says, stew. What's in the stew? Rabbit. Rabbit and what else? Horse meat. Equal proportions, 50-50, one horse, one rabbit. Oh, I stop with the jokes. <laughs> jokes. We have to find a Gentile. Where? Who? How? Do I know a single Gentile in this town? Do I know a Jew even? That's the first place. And the second place, suppose we find one, and everything goes fine with the tests. How do we know they'll take them in? And how much will it cost? That's the first place. Papa. Oh, Moshe. <laughs> Ah, look, a boy. Look at the size of him. Oh, how do you feel, Moshe? All right. Mama told you about the system? I'm an expert already. So? I found the boy. Who? You found? Cholyava, the shoemaker. I went to take my shoes over. I met his son. He works in the shop. He's my age. We got to talking. He wants to enter the school. You spoke to his father? No, he said he'd do that. Fine, fine. You invite him over for supper. I'll make a fancy supper. After supper, you'll study. And Aaron, you'll go over and see Mr. Cholyava. You'll get his permission. Wait, 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 wait. Stop. Already the locomotive is racing. Let's examine the proposition cautiously and quietly, like grown-up people. Cautiously. This boy, Kholyava's son, how do we know he'll pass the examination? You had took two years. You had eight years' study before that. How do we know how long this will take? Maybe a lifetime. Have a tutor the boy. Sure, Papa. He's smart. We talk. Besides, you'll help him with the tutoring. With you and Mama and me, we'll both pass. I'll help with the tutoring. Wait a minute, that's not such a foolish idea. I know the X's, the square of the hypotenuse. I'll help him conjugate the declensions. But not salami or garlic, Papa. Certainly not. We'll conjugate potatoes, trains, principles even. <laughs> Only remember, if Esau fails to pass the examination, then Jacob also. Oh, I think the good Lord has smiled on us today. <laughs> Now? Do you think there were ten plagues? A uh, hundred and ten. He failed the examination, Khalagi. No, he passed. You decided not to pay the tuition? I paid, I paid. I bought him the books, the uniform, a cap with a fancy badge. I even gave the principal a schmear I didn't have to. I'm bankrupt twice over, that's not it. So? So nothing. The father, the shoemaker, he says he doesn't want his boy to go to a school where there's so many Jews. So what did you say? He says, why should I send my boy to a school like that when I can send him to any school I want? So what did you say? <laughs> what could I say? He was right. Where are you going? I'm not sitting on a chair. What? <laughs> you think just because a man said no, I'm going to give up now? So what'll you do? What'll I do? I'll go. I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him if he says yes. 
As if I didn't know that's what you'd say. And what do you say? I'm still the man in the family, Hannah. I'll go. And what do you say? I'll find something. Aaron Katz can still talk. What? What I'll say. Well, first we'll have a little drink, then a little discussion, then another little drink. I'll tell him what a fine high school this is. Then maybe another little drink. He'll see the advantages. You sit down. Now's no time for tricks. In the morning when he gets home with the drink and he'll think about it, he'll say no again. No, so what would you say? I don't know. I'll say that we worked hard, that we... No. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I have an idea. What? What? I'll say to him, Mr. Kholyava, you have a son, I have a son. They're friends. They don't know Jew, Gentile. They like each other. Now, what does it hurt you if my son, Moshe, should have a chance like your boy, like any other boy? Mr. Kholyava, you, you're not a rich man. A shoemaker is not a rich man. How many hours a day do you work? And, and, and what, have you, what have you got, huh? What have you got, expensive cigars? A cottage in the summer, a nice old age. You haven't. We're the same, Mr. Khalyab, the same trouble. You call us a name, we call you a name. So who does it help? Hannah, maybe the two of us? Aaron, put on your hat. <laughs> Knuckles don't crack anymore. What have I got to crack my knuckles about? <laughs> the boy's in school already three weeks. The greatest blessing in the world. He's got nothing to crack his knuckles about. Mind you, I'm not complaining. My old shop in the village I sold for a loss. All right. All my friends I left behind to come here and live so as to be with you and Moisha. All right. I have to start over in business at my age, from the beginning, like a newborn. <laughs> All right. Who's there at the door? Moshe. Oh, Khalyava, come in. How's your father? Fine, thank you. School is finished already. What time is it? School's not finished yet. What are you doing home so soon? Uh, where's your cap? Papa. And yours too, Khalyava. Didn't I buy you a new cap with a fancy badge? Where are the badges? We took them off, Papa. You what? Took them off. That's right, Mama. And we won't put them on again. What are you talking about? We're on strike, Papa. You're on what? Call a strike, Mr. Katz. Thank you. The word I heard before, strike. Now listen to me, the both of you, quick, before anybody finds out. Get the caps, put on the badges, and Papa's hope... right. Run back to school. Maybe the teacher doesn't see you are missing. We can't, Mama. Why? What happened? What's the difference? What happened? N now listen to me quietly, without excitement. How many years did we work and slave? You, Moisha, Mama, me, uh, Kholyava, you too. That's right, Mr. Katz. Papa, we... something happened. Please! If you don't have pity on me, at least have pity on yourself. Listen to an old man, three times your age. Don't you know who'll be blamed? You, we're always the scapegoats. Papa, let me explain. No, never mind explain. Go back. Go back. I I'm telling you, go, go, Aaron, go. Aaron, sit down. Let the boys talk. So what happened? When we got to school today, there was a big crowd outside. All the students were there, and they were marching up and down in front of the gate. And they carried a big sign, no quotas, and they were singing. Certainly, of course. I can tell you what they were singing. Aaron, please. So where was the principal? He was standing on the steps and shouting at all the students, but nobody listened to him. Then, one of the seniors climbed up on the gate and made a speech. A Jewish boy? No, Mama. He said it was a strike against the quotas, that there shouldn't be any quotas, that school should be for everybody and free, too. A Gentile boy said that? And what else did he say, this boy? What else did he say? I can tell you. I'm an expert. The world is changing, he said. The world is opening up. This is the dawn of a new day. No more pogroms, no ghettos, no quotas. Education is free. In this fine new world, there will be no Jews, no Gentiles, no rich, no poor, no underdogs, no undercats. This is what he said, no? No, not like that, Papa. But he did say nobody should have to beg for an education. 
it should be free. He said that. Certainly, of course. So what are we waiting for? Open up the chicken coops, let out all the chickens. They should be free, too. And the shop. Tomorrow I'll go there early. I'll put a big sign in the window. Help yourself, everybody. It's free. Aaron. It's free. Aaron, look at me. Listen, you, you, you like the quota. You don't think the school should be free for everybody? What's the matter? You like traveling around looking for a school? It was a pleasure smearing the principal. They're looking for an answer. What's our answer? I know. You don't have to tell me. Strike. Of course, strike. You don't have enough to eat. Strike. The draft is taking your son's strike. You don't like the ghetto strike. They pass a decree you can't own a certain business strike. Strike. We'll talk, you, Moshe, Chalavi, and me. This is the day I'll remember the rest of my life. Well, Shalom Aleichem. Peace be with you.
All right, we'll call the whole thing off. Eighty. Eighty? Well, I'm going. My wife will wonder what happened to me. Seventy-five. Shalom Aleichem, seventy-seven. Aleichem Shalom, seventy-six. Sold. I see you're a man who appreciates value. All right, all right. But there's no doubt that this is a... a, a she-goat. But you said a goat for milking. You think I'd sell you a... a billy goat? Of course not. <laughs> She'll give, at the very least, a pail of milk a day. Goodbye, Malkala. Malkala. <laughs> To make a long story short, when she told me the goat gives a pail of milk a day, I offered her 40 zlatas, and she sold it to me. Fine, fine, very fine. If we switch a male goat for his female goat, it could be very funny. A boy ripe, a go So you're going to celebrate your new goat, huh? So tomorrow night you'll come. Uh -huh. We'll eat blintzes together. Did you ever stop and think what you can make from goat's milk? For instance, the omelet. An omelet is an omelet, but from goat's milk, it's a... A symphony, a symphony. Or else we'll make... You'll come? Of course I'll come. Invite me. You're invited. Boy, how do this have a little bit of a welcome? Boy, hey, please, I go for... matter, Rivkala? A pail of milk a day at least, she said. Maybe a pail a day, but not milk. It's a billy goat. A genuine female, she said. Enough. Take it back already. Bring back what I sent you for, a female goat that brings milk. Enough. I'll tell you, but you wouldn't tell another soul? No, no. This woman who sold me the goat. Yeah. It was a billy goat. Oh, no. Boy, Good morning, Mr. Kaplan. Good morning. Give me back my money. Just a minute. What's the difficulty? Listen, lady, do I look like a child? Does it strike you I was born only yesterday? Please, Malamit, I'm a busy woman. So if you're a busy woman, give me back my money and take back your billy goat. What? Where are your eyes? Never mind. I trusted you. I paid you the price you asked, and you do this to me. I won't say another word. Watch. Impossible. Milk from a billy goat. This is milk. This is the goat that gave the milk. You're a malamed. It's a lady goat. Only an hour ago it was a billy goat. Now, what have you been drinking? Who gets to drink that, Dodie? All right, so take your goat and goodbye. Goodbye, Malkala. 
Look, ladies, <laughs> I'm convinced. I really am. This is a lady goat. Only do me a favor. You have a rabbi here? What a question. You have a rabbi in hell? Are we godless people? Are we? Well, uh, there's no need to get excited. I only ask a simple question. Is there a rabbi? So? So? Please ask him to do me a favor, to give me a certificate that says that this is a lady goat that gives milk. It's crazy. I just milked her. You saw me milk her. Here's the milk. I know it. You know it. <laughs> the goat knows it. But for Ifkala, my wife, take me to your rabbi. On the way back, he stopped off at Dodie's. And Dodie, once again, so, when the Malamad got back to his house... <laughs> I'm speechless. Absolutely speechless. For the first time in my life, I don't have a word to say. What did I do, Rifkala? Nothing. Not a thing. Only do me a favor. The next time I send you for something, don't go. You said a goat that gives milk. This is the goat. I saw the woman. Please, I... not another word. It's a billy goat. Impossible. <laughs> Listen to that poor girl. Not only is it impossible, but I have a certificate here that says that this is a lady goat that gives milk signed by three expert witnesses, including the rabbi. Would the rabbi tell a lie? Would the goat herd lie too? Would all three sign a paper bearing false witness, would they? Please, somebody come and take him away. Why excite yourself? This is beyond us. You say this goat is a billy goat. The certificate says that this is a lady goat that gives milk. We'll take the problem to Rabbi David, who, after all, is the wisest man in all Helm. He'll settle it. Go get it. I see. <laughs> One, two, three witnesses, including a rabbi. Fine-looking document, huh, rabbi? What's the difference of document? Look at the goat. Is that a female goat? The animal is without question a he-goat. There are certain unmistakable signs. Of course, I told you. But the document, Rabbi. But still, the document is not to be denied. Don't forget, three witnesses, including a rabbi. So this is my decision. Yes. yes. The law is on the side of the Malamed. The animal is a she-goat. And this is proved beyond all question by the document. But it is equally clear and it must be so ordained that whenever a she-goat is brought into Helm by some process beyond my understanding, she becomes a he-goat. Uh, Rabbi David, if you weren't too busy, would you stay for dinner? If I were not too busy for Rifkala's cooking, I would be pleased to stay. Well, Rabbi, if you could stay and you weren't too busy, what would you like? Blintzes. The rest of my queen, where are you going? My lama, though, my king. Take the goat to the next town. And when the he-goat becomes a she-goat, Court is in session waiting for you. Won't you sit here? Sit, won't you? of Bonschischweig. Start, but be brief. The defending angel. Ready. The prosecuting angel. Always ready. Proceed, but quickly. His name is Bonschischweig. Bonsche, the silent. And his name fitted him like a cloak made in the hands of a master tailor. No similes, please. His death, like his life on earth, made no impression. 
If a horse had dropped dead in the street, it would have attracted more attention. But then if there were as many horses as there are men like him, the horse, too, would have gone unnoticed. Metaphor. No metaphors. He never complained of either God or man. Hatred never flashed into his eyes. He never raised his voice in bitterness to heaven. Rhetoric. And no rhetoric, please. Job was unlucky. This man was even less fortunate. At his bris, no wine was drunk. At his bar mitzvah, no speeches were made. He lived like a grain of sand, along with millions like him. And when the wind picked him up and blew him upside down, no one noticed. My dear angel for the defense, this is a soul on trial. The facts, only the facts are what we want. His mother died when he was 13, and he inherited a stepmother, who was a snake. Insinuations against a third party? Come, come. I beg your pardon. He didn't complain. Instead of food, he got moldy bread. Instead of meat, he got the gristle and skin. Winter times, he chopped the wood barefoot in the yard, his hands and feet frozen. The black and blue marks showed through the holes in his pants. Did he complain? Yes, yes, proceed. He didn't even complain to his father. This is what this. His father, that drunk. You'll be heard from all in due time. Proceed. He had nobody to play with ever. He never spent a day in the cheder. He never had a book. He never had a coat that wasn't somebody else's first. He never had a minute to himself. His father, drunk one night, threw him out of the house into the street. He picked himself up and went, whichever way the wind was blowing. However hungry he got, he kept silent. He begged only with his eyes. How many times he was arrested? Vagrancy, loitering, no visible means of support, I couldn't begin to tell you. How many times he found work the dirtiest, the heaviest, the most meal, and didn't get paid, I couldn't list them all. And worse than working, harder was the finding of the work. And through it all, silence. Could I suggest, please, time is... Oh. Please. No. You go on. When they splashed mud on him, when they spit on him, when they made him walk in the gutter and told him, keep off the sidewalk, when he stood in a doorway begging for money, he was owed on a job, and they told him, come back later, now it's not convenient. When they paid him, as they did, only in part, or cheated him, or gave him counterfeit money, he kept silent, although starvation and death were constantly at his side. Once, good fortune smiled. He stopped two runaway horses and saved the life of the man inside, the owner of the carriage although the driver of the carriage was killed. He was made the coachman, and he inherited a wife. And more than that, a child. The wife and child of the driver killed in the accident. When his newfound benefactor went bankrupt and didn't pay him what he was owed, he was silent. When his new wife ran away and left him with a newborn baby, he was silent. And 15 years later, when the boy grew up and threw him out of the house, even then, silence. And the same benefactor ran him down on the street and the carriage wheels rolled over him. He didn't tell the police who had done it. And in the hospital, his back broken, nothing. And in a hospital, you can say anything. Scream, even, it's permitted. Yes. And when the doctor wouldn't touch his case without payment in advance, and the same for the hospital attendant who wouldn't give him a glass of water without first being paid, even then, silence. Silence in his last minute on earth in the death struggle. Silence in death. Have you finished? <clears throat> One moment more. He was buried in a pauper's grave. Even the grave digger doesn't remember him. A little stick was put up to mark the grave. The next day, the wind blew it over, and the grave digger's wife found it and used it to stir a pot of potatoes. And in all, from birth to death, 
Not a word against God. Not a word against man. The defending angel has concluded. Then the prosecuting angel. Angels in heaven. Angels in heaven. As he was silent, angels in heaven. So I will be silent. Bonchirschweig. Bonchir, my child. Bonchiller. and you kept silent all your life. We all have blinces. <laughs> well, that settled it. And all the townsfolk marveled that a new Solomon was in Helm. So, the Malamed, his wife, Rabbi David, the goat, and all the Helamites settled down to a normal life. And they would be at it still to this very day. Except that all the Chalmites are no longer a hell. You see, they were scattered during a very heavy rain that almost destroyed their city. And they went to all parts of the earth. Maybe you met one in your lifetime. Who knows? Maybe there's one sitting next to you right now. What would the world of Sholem Aleichem be without Isaac Loeb Peretz? Isaac in Hebrew means laughter. Isaac Loeb Peretz. A man who was a poet, a playwright, a journalist. He ran a flour mill, was the manager of a brewery, a Hebrew teacher, and also he was a lawyer. This story, and others like this, he used to read in the language of the working people in Yiddish, to the working people. And because in those days this was not very popular with the Tsar, Isaac Lowe Peretz spent a little time in jail. Well, it's a fact, what can I do? And later, nearly 50 years later, in another terrible time for the Jews, in the Hitler time, in Warsaw, in the ghetto itself, this story was read at the risk of your life. Still, the people read it. It's not a long story. It's not a big story. In Yiddish, it runs about 12 pages. In English, about nine and a half. A story in Yiddish is always 25% better. Well, 25% longer anyway. It's not a weighty story. Not a poem, as we say. But a story, a mice. It is called Buncher Schwein, which means Buncher the Silent. 
and it begins in heaven with the sound of the ram's horn. You can hear it all the way up to the seventh heaven. Maybe he's creating a new world, a second creation. Do you think it could be Judgment Day? Listen to that. What's happening here? You haven't heard? Buncher Schweig is dead. Who? Buncher Schweig. has left the earth. Buncher Schweig? Buncher Schweig. Really? Listen, listen. He's at the heavenly gate. Who? I've got to get Father Abraham. Who? What's that? Wait, it's his armchair, the golden armchair for Buncher Schwein. Who? Oh, how beautiful. This will be his crown. Look at those pearls and the diamonds in the center. I have to take it to the Holy Presence. He wants to inspect it himself. Don't. The heavenly court hasn't met yet. Has the heavenly court met yet? What difference does it make? It's just a formality. Even from Moses, they held heavenly court. Listen, if this case lasts longer than five minutes, well, you don't understand. This is Bonsha Spy. Who? He's here. He's come, that Bonsha Spy. There he comes, Bonsha Spy. There he is.
Come, bunch. Yes, you, bunch is right. Come. Don't you know me? I'm Abraham, Father Abraham. Pinch yourself, you'll see it's not a dream. Come into the heavenly presence. Come. Come. Be sure and send me your slippers. I have put down your slippers because if I wrote my slippers, you would read my slippers and send me your slippers. So therefore I say plainly your slippers so you will know and send me my slippers. Now, Rivkala herself is a somebody. A person with definite ideas and opinions. A person with a superior mentality, even for help. So, Rivkala, how much do I owe you for your uncle's letter? Let's see. Um, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, and three is seven. And seven, two, four, let's see. Ah, two times seven is eleven. <coughs> Excuse me, Rivkala, two times seven is fourteen. No, you're wrong. Two I'm times seven is eleven. I'm wrong? Of course. When I married the Malamud, I was a widow with four children. He, too, at the time was a widow, and he had four children. Since we are married together, we have three children. So he has seven children, and I have seven children. Together, we have eleven. Now, we are almost ready for the story of the goat. I said almost, because there's one last thing that you must understand. The relationship between the Melamed and his wife. Now listen carefully, because this is not a simple matter. Ah, my Melamed, you're back from the market. Of course I'm back. I went, I'm back. So where's the chicken I sent you to buy? Well, when I went to see the woman who sells the chicken, she said her chicken was so fat. Oh, oh I said. Fat is better than chicken. So when I went to see the man who sells the fat, he said his fat was so wonderful, it was like oil. Oh, I said, oil is better than fat. So when I got there, they said their oil was so pure, it was like water. Aha, I said, water is better than oil. So, instead of a chicken, I brought you a pitcher of water. So I'll get you a glass. Why? Your dinner is ready. Now we are ready for the story. Then this time I mean it. Unless, of course, you insist on a few words about a goat. But what can you say about a goat? A goat is a goat. And this goat was not even from Chelm, but from the next village, which was famous for its goats. And that's the point of the whole story. So one morning,
from morning till night and deprive ourselves all our lives. Here, take the money we saved. Go to the next village, get a goat. And tonight, we'll have blintzes for supper. I'll go this minute. Not so fast. You remember with the chicken? Of course I remember. So this time, a goat. Naturally, a goat. And please, a female goat that gives milk. Does milk come from a billy goat? Does a pitcher of water lay eggs? Stopped off at an inn which was run by his friend Dodi. Now Dodi served a very nice glass of wine, not very expensive, and a very pleasant fellow to talk to. But also he was given to practical jokes. So in a little while we'll have the goat. Bye. 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 What is it? Hold still, 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 still. Zip. What was it? Nothing. I thought it was a fly. It has all the shame of the candy metal for one and boy guy. Pretty ugly friend. Perfectly shabby looking animal. It's a wonder it's standing on its legs at all. And the eyes. <laughs> you should see so good. This morning a man was here. He offered an exchange for our go to cow. I turned him down. She should only live till I get her home. Sixties lutters. As a matter of fact, she's not for sale. One hundred. One hundred? Well, in that case, I'm going. Goodbye. Sixty-five. I shouldn't stand here talking to you. My children are sick. Ninety. Ninety? I think I hear one of them crying. You better go in. Seventy! All right!
Hello, I'm Morris Konofsky. The world of Sholem Aleichem is everybody's world. It is filled with all the pleasures and disappointments of life. Its people are sad and funny, foolish and wise. Some good, some bad. Sholem Aleichem embraced them all. He wrote of their strength with pride, of their weakness with affection. He was a man who loved people. And in a moment, you will meet some that he loved best. I apologize. I don't mean to stare. Just looking. Trying to figure out what in all these treasures would interest you the most. My name is Mendel the bookseller. And I have here anything that a learned man could want in the way of a book. Here are novels, poetry, Edition of the commentaries, good up to page 187, and the rest. But. So, while wisdom is no substitute for a piece of herring, a house with only fish is not a home. So browse, look them over, test the binding. Some have pictures. Please, no obligation to buy. Oh, perhaps you would enjoy a four spice. Yeah. Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem is not only the name of a great Yiddish writer, but it is also an ancient greeting, meaning peace be with you. Oh, you knew that? When Sholem Aleichem had been in this country a short time, he met at the old Waldorf Astoria the great American writer, Mark Twain. And he introduced himself by saying, Pardon my seeming in modesty, but they tell me, sir, that I'm the Yiddish Mark Twain. Mark Twain smiled and said, and they tell me, sir, that I'm the American Sholem Aleichem. You know something? Mark Twain was really Samuel Clemens, and Sholem Aleichem was Solomon Rabinowitz. Oh, you knew that too, huh? Oh, now the false price. Sholem Aleichem wrote here a story called The Enchanted Tailor. Now, where did he get the idea for the story? Like all great artists from the people. It's a folk story. It's a tale about Helm. What, you ask, is Helm? Helm is a famous city in the old country. And what's so special about Helm? Well, I'll tell you. Or better still, this passing angel will tell you. Because, you see, in a way, she is responsible. Well, go ahead, go ahead, tell him. Tell him we're among friends. Well, I guess I did it. Me, the angel Rachele, charged with distributing souls all over the earth. It's a big job, you'll admit. And one that even an angel could get tired of after several centuries and, and, and make a mistake. Well, I was flying as usual with my two bags of souls, one filled naturally with wise souls and one filled with poor souls. So over Helm, there's that high mountain and that very high tree, <laughs> which I did not see. And, well, the sun got in my eyes. And, and the top of the tree ripped the bag filled with foolish souls and spilled them down in Helm. And that is how it came to be that Helm is, well, is filled with foolish souls. <laughs> <clears throat> That's history. Now, let's meet our characters. First, the Melamed, a Hebrew teacher. 
His good wife, Rivka. Their great advisor, Rabbi David. And their goats. <laughs> but you want to see a goat? What's so special about a goat? A goat is a goat. Well, so one day, Rabbi David, the wisest man in all of Helm, made this startling pronouncement. From now on, every poor man will eat cream, and every rich man will drink sour milk. What? No. no. Yes, I have discovered how to do it. So tell us, please, Rabbi. Let a decree be issued that from now on, sour milk is called cream, and cream is called sour milk. Rabbi, something has been bothering me. Could you tell me, please, why does a dog wag his tail? Because, my child, the dog is stronger than the tail. If it were the other way around, the tail would wag the dog. Then tell me this, Rabbi David. Why does the hair on a man's head turn gray before his beard? Well, what would you expect? The hair on a man's head is 20 years older than his beard. Oh. Rabbi, something else has been bothering me. I have plenty of time. Why is the ocean so salty? You don't know that. Naturally, because of the thousands of herrings who live there. <laughs> That is the wisest man in all of Helm. Now, the Malala. Rifkila, my queen. Yes, my Malamad. Rifkila, my queen. I've been thinking. Good, my Malamad. If I were the Tsar, I'd be richer than the Tsar. How, my Malamad? I would do a little teaching on the side. Oh. That is only one side of his nature. For the other, I must tell you that once the Malamad left Helm and he forgot to take his slippers. So he sat down and he wrote a letter to his wife. 